today we are glad to have back Sara Lachevere. She is talking about her second book, Ask For It, How Women Can Use the Power of Negotiation to Get What They Really Want. This was a great book. I was so excited and um, this feels like it was divinely timed because I had a client who was literally going through everything in this book. So I was super mm -hmm. excited to um, read this book. So welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. How are you? Good. I'm doing great. I really, um, I, I can tell you that your book helped um, coach my client a great deal is, um, and, and a lot of the concepts that are on here. So um, the book is broken down into um, several different parts. One is getting clear about like what is it that you want, which I think is so yeah. critical yeah. to any mm -hmm. negotiation. And then um, doing research. So I figured we, it's hard to get go through the what you know, run your own life, but I thought we could actually use your book in the format. And what I'm hoping to do, because I get these, these questions all the time with clients mm -hmm. is to do a couple practice, like pretend that I'm the yeah. employer and you're the, you're the, and we can do a couple of very common scenarios so that people can, because what I've noticed, as you mentioned in the book is that it's all about practicing and sometimes yeah. when people know the language to use, they can kind of mm -hmm. like, well, I don't like what she said, but I could say it in this way. It's a lot easier yeah. when you have a script to play. Yeah. So I was thinking we could take some common scenarios that I've seen um, mm -hmm. as a career coach and run through those. Um, yes. I just want to say, ask for it has a lot of great language um, that you can, rather than having to sort of think it up yourself, we give you a lot of examples that you can, as you said, adapt, adapt to your own circumstances, but a good foundation, good place to start. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think a lot of people, women in particular, are uncomfortable with negotiating because they think it has to be adversarial. And in fact, it doesn't. And that's the kind of language we're encouraging people to use. Problem solving. What do you need? This is what I can do. This is what I'm looking for. Let's work it out together. Yeah, actually. So it doesn't I, feel out of there is actually a great quote in here. Um, I used to do business development, and so I used to do negotiating all the time. And um, what I liked, and I'm seeing if I can find this quote. I don't know if I can find it offhand, but it was something along the lines of, you know, the very best negotiations happen when you listen and you understand what are the factors or priorities, what is it that you both want. And so right. if you don't have clarity on that yourself, then it puts mm -hmm. you in an instant disadvantage when you're negotiating. I think it's, it's, right. it's you don't really know what you want. So what are you negotiating for? Um, and I think it's also, um, yeah, so I, 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 the listening and understanding the person's priorities and then mm -hmm. coming in with the spirit of let's work together and figure out how we can make this work. I think is so much more powerful than the, I want this. And if you don't give me this, I'm out of here. <laughs> right, right. Not a good approach, particularly not for women. People do not respond well to women they think are being too aggressive or too demanding. And fortunately, that's not the best approach anyway. Yes. Uh, this more problem solving, collaborative approach produces better outcomes, better agreements for both sides. So that's nice for people who don't like that more competitive um style because it actually is superior but i also want to pick up something you said about knowing what you want uh, when i teach workshops sometimes people will raise their hands and say well aren't you worried people will get asking fatigue if you're just asking 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 for stuff all the time and that's actually not what i'm suggesting i want people to start with their goals what is it that you want not what you think you should want or what is straight ahead that you think you can get or you know whatever feels within reach or is, you know, the traditional path. Mm. Think about what you want holistically, you know, how you want your work life to balance with your home life, what your long-term goals are, your mid-term, your, your near-end goals, and then ask for the things that are going to get you what you want, yeah. not the things that, you know, you can just get. Okay, I have two things I want to share. Um, let me see if I can remember them. One is a conversation. I talked to this gal from um, a friend of mine who works at Amazon who just asked for a raise. And mm -hmm. we were talking about the interview that I have, so I have, mm -hmm. I have some questions on that. Mm -hmm. And the second is my own experience when it was review time. I was working at Microsoft. It was time for review. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, the pressures all the time is that you're deciding how many options you're going to give someone and how, with the salary raise that you're going to give someone. And I understand that from a from a 
boss perspective, that's what they're trying to like, you know, figure out. And they're mm-hmm. stack ranking all of the different employees that, that work for them. And they're mm-hmm. trying to figure out, it, this is so awful at Microsoft, we used to say who we're going to throw off the boat and who we're going to keep right. on the boat. And mm-hmm. for better or worse, at that time, which was a long time ago, 20 years ago, anyone who had a kid and was working part time was thrown off the boat immediately. And so yeah, you're like terrible. a second. That was the time. I don't know if it's that, that way anymore. But I, I went to my boss and I was like, listen, I know it's review time. And I know that it's hard to, to, to you know, try to get me to be on the higher level of the bonuses and salaries mm-hmm. and whatever that you're going to give. I totally get that. So um, what I would counter propose, you know, give me whatever the lowest. I, I, I honestly, at this point, I, I don't care about the options because I'm probably going to leave in the next couple of years. I mean, I would did just say that I did because I was going to leave. I was like, I don't think I'm going to ever like the way that uh, 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 options work is it takes you another two years before you actually get fully subscribed. So it's like this is going to be four years until I can even get at even a slice of these options. And I really they're not going to be worth much at that time. They yeah, weren't yeah. going to be worth much at Microsoft. And so I said, you know what? I, at this point, what I just want is free time. If you mm. give me, like, basically, don't get, like, I, I, I will willing to negotiate the salary and the bonus options if you just give me X amount of time and I can work in this following way so that I can actually mm. get more free time and flexibility because that's really what I wanted. I really, because yeah. I knew I was going to leave. I didn't know how many, but it was probably good in the last five years. And the salary, it just wasn't, we had made enough um, money through previous options that I didn't have to like be like niggling on, on money. It really wasn't what I cared about. But going back to your mm-hmm. comma about it's what you want, because I don't. I think, he was, want. I think yeah. he was surprised, right? Because he had yeah. people filing Nobody in there. Nobody ever said, I don't care about the money. Give me less money. <laughs> <laughs> or get, you know, just give yeah. me the same yeah. amount of money, right. but give me free Some time, because that's that I what I care for. about yeah. the most. And it honestly was what I cared about. So it's going back to, and it was. Yeah. I think it shocked him. And the surprising mm-hmm. thing is in terms, he did give me a, a very generous raise, and he even gave me options, which I told him not to do. So it was mm. very, it's very confusing <laughs> to me, but it was, uh-huh. and he was the most generous of all the different bosses that I had mm. ever had when I was working part time. So who knows how all of this works, but I do think knowing what you want is important. And then I, I wanted to follow up on the comment that you made about women specifically. Mm. So I have this gal. Um, who's a dear friend of mine, she works as an attorney at Amazon, mm-hmm. which is like pretty, you know, too like oh. hardcore Amazon, hardcore <laughs> attorney, <laughs> like she's yeah. a litigator, right? So you're already mm-hmm. working with like someone who's right. kind of a hard driving person. And she was um, advocating for either a raise or a positional title or something. Mm-hmm. And she she has this kind of constant continence. Like she's kind of was like born mm-hmm. through your soul. So she walked in and she's like, listen, I've been doing the analysis. You know, I'm looking at the stuff and I think what's fair based on the amount of work that I'm doing and the, the level of work that I'm doing and the amount of work that I'm doing that I deserve a raise because, you know, when I'm looking at the comparables, you know, but so she'd done all her research, yeah. um, but she went in it with this kind of like negotiating tactic that you would if you're a litigator. Right, right. And she said that her relationship was not the same afterwards. After that. And then yeah. her boss would like see her and be like running away. Oh, no. <laughs> so I wanted to get your sense of what you think happened in that scenario. Because I think you mentioned, I think I have my hypothesis, but I wanted to get your perspective on what you think happened in that scenario. Well, we know that people don't like women they perceive to be too aggressive and that's other women as well as men don't like women they think are too aggressive and of course behavior that in a man might be yeah, fine you know he's got his eye on the prize he's goal oriented he's you know task focused and a woman might seem too aggressive and we think of negotiation as a kind of an in, aggressive interaction if we approach it as i win you lose mm. And that's why this collaborative approach works better for everybody, but particularly for women because they don't come off as quite so aggressive. 
So she kind of, you know, whatever, shot herself in the foot probably by coming on, you know, what did you say? Her eyes were born. Yeah, it was just like, because she has this way of like looking when she negotiates, which is kind of how she negotiates on the behalf of her company to her benefit. Right. Right. Well, the thing is, in an ideal world, women could just negotiate as themselves. This is who I am. This is how I do business. Give me what I've des- what I deserve, what I've earned. It just doesn't really work that well when women are negotiating for themselves. And I found this to be a, a strangely big issue for attorneys because you think these are professional negotiators. That's what they right. do for a thing. And then they'll say, oh, I never negotiate for anything for myself. I never ask for anything for myself. I'll negotiate for my client, for my kids, for, you know, whatever, but not for me. And I think that's because these women have sensed that the style that they have developed, cultivated over years of training and, and experience, doesn't work well in the private sphere, in the you know when it's for them, and they don't know how to do it. And so the style thing is really critical for women. And whenever I talk about this, I get some pushback. Women are like, "Why should I have to work so hard?" And, you know, it is an extra burden that I have to be worried about. You know, whoever else is in the room, and you know, are they having a good time? Are they, you know, am I coming off as likable? And I agree, it is an extra burden on women. It takes, you know, got more cognitive cogs spinning. Um, And it's dumb that women have to do that. But it is pragmatic if you can do that. Use those social skills. Use your ability to read a situation and work more to come off as likable. The research is quite clear. To be persuasive or influential, which is, of course, what you want to do in a negotiation Women need to come off as likable. Men make a good argument, set out your proposal. Yeah, we can hear it. When women seem a little too aggressive, it's very hard for other people to hear the justice of what they're asking for, to actually evaluate objectively what it is they presented. So I'm a, a coach, and I was saying, and I was saying to her, like, let me. Can you just tell me what happened when you said, like, just get? Can you actually just, yeah. like read back his physiology? I just want to understand what happened. And so she said that she went in and she presented the data, and she thought she was being like very kind. But I'm like, were you smiling? She's like, no. And I said, okay, well, um, what was his reaction? And she he she said that yeah. he kind of like went back, crossed his arms, and had this kind of like I'm a bad boy <laughs> scenario. Oh, no. And I thought, oh, and so I'm thinking from, you know, a coach perspective, I thought, oh, like, I wonder, you know, so what I've noticed when I'm coaching clients that whatever kind of authority issues that they have with their mommy or daddies come flying back in the work environment. And I thought, or wives, you know, in that case, like, what are the relationships that he has with women, mother, sister, wife? Uh Whatever. And, and did this re trigger yeah. something about him feeling guilty about not doing enough at home or not being a good enough son or not, you know, getting scolded by right. his mom? I don't really know. But so this is kind of, I know that you don't cover this in the book, but do you think yeah. that that's a factor? Well, I think we all bring our own baggage to any situation. And lots of men have been socialized, not just by their experiences in their families or at school, but by all the noise of the culture, the movies they watch, the television they consume, the books, the magazines, whatever, to not respond well when women come on uh, in what they feel is too strong a manner. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, men are the products of their socialization too. It's not that they're willfully wanting to discriminate against women or hold them back, but they have internalized a lot of these implicit biases, we Mm -hmm. call them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is real. Um, And, you know, women need to be prepared for it and understand it and not get immediately angry. Like, you know, whatever, you're not responding fairly or appropriately because that just compounds the problem. And I think there is this fear that women have that if they negotiate strongly, if they aim high and they, you know, present a a pretty well-reasoned argument that's kind of, you know, asking for a lot, that it will damage the relationship Mm -hmm. between them and the other negotiator. And I actually think, and I think the data supports this, that it's not the content of the ask so much as it is the style, the behavior. Uh. Yeah, because she said that it affected the relationship and she doesn't yeah. know how to get it back on track. And so, right. so 
All right, so let me ask a question. Um, so let's pretend that you're now her. You're okay. an attorney trying to get a negotiation for me. Okay. And I and I could be, I'm just curious, I could be a guy or I could be a woman, and I'm kind of curious if the response, if the approach would be different. And then um, I'd like to know, like, how to fix it, you know? So she came on too strong, number one. And so now I want to figure out, like, I want to, after we talk, go through this, I want to get a sense of, like, okay, you did your, like, Amazon negotiating style. <laughs> like, it blew up in your face. Yeah. What do you do? Okay, so let's actually do the first one. So you're her, and you're trying to ask for a raise or a promotion or some type of title enhancement. And, uh, you know, so I'm the boss. Should I, I'll, I'll, does it matter if I'm a guy or, or a woman, or do you think the response would be the same? Um, the research suggests that two women negotiating together are more likely to take that collaborative problem-solving approach and reach better agreements. Two men negotiating together tend to be more competitive. Mm -hmm. I win, you lose, zero sum, tend to actually produce inferior agreements. Man and a woman negotiating together, not quite as good as two women, but better than, than two men. Now, those are, you know, broad generalizations based on data. You're always going to have to read the room, and there are different personalities, and I've heard a lot of women say, oh, the worst boss I ever had was a woman, or, you know, whatever. I actually think that's probably, in many cases, not true, that what happened was not that this woman behaved more heartlessly or le in a less supportive way or was uh, less generous than a man, but that she did not conform to our expectations that women will be nurturing and caretaking. And when people violate our, our social expectations, we mark it, right? Hmm, not, not right, not good, not, not supportive. A man could behave the same way, and we don't mark it because that's how we expect men to behave. So we collect this data, all these little check marks, you know, women ungenerous, women not supportive, da, da, da. And, you know, I've talked to men who, you know, male lawyers, men in mergers and acquisitions, uh, hedge fund guys, they say, oh, we're sharks. We, you know, undercut each other. We don't, we're, you know, we're all trying to win and beat the other guy, but we don't mind it as much because that's what we expect of men. I think overall, the research is pretty clear that women tend to be mostly supportive of one another, but you're going to run into some women who, whatever, had to fight and claw their way to get where they are and they'd don't like it if it's easier for everybody else. There are women like that, but I think they're a minority. So that's a long way around. Yeah. And, so there's, yeah. and there's unconscious bias that you've mentioned before. Yeah. So the unconscious bias is, as I understand it from your previous book, is yeah. when you presume like, you're a woman, therefore I'm expecting you to behave in a particular genera, you know, um, gender-like fashion, which is to be collaborative, to smile and move. But if I'm too collaborative or look too nice, and like that's also not good. So there's this kind right, of right. like, like balance that I'm trying to, this really yeah. delicate yeah. balance. Yeah, no, that's why I said it's dumb and it's a burden to get it just right. <laughs> Um, I'm not saying this is easy, but it is worth trying okay. to get right. Okay. So you're, so, so you're my anyway, friend. So First of all, what research would you have done um, beforehand? You want a, a raise or a title enhancement or whatever at your company. You're an attorney. What's the mm -hmm. kind of research that you do first and foremost? Well, there are two pieces of it. You want to research what other people at the same level in the organization are getting doing. And by that, I don't just mean money. I mean opportunities, responsibilities, titles, whatever they're getting and getting to do. And you can often, with a big company, a lot of that information is posted. You know, And if you work for the, for the government or if you work for a big educational institution, often you can go online and find that data. You can also go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and they have a ton of data online about what people are getting in certain, you know, whatever demographics, certain regions, because, of course, there are big regional differences. Parse pretty fine. But there are also places like, uh, you know, whatever, salary.com, monster.com. Uh, Payscale is a great resource. Glassdoor, where you can get information about what people doing what you're doing at the same level what they're getting so you want to try to get as much information internal information and sometimes you could just ask hr you know 
what what's the range? People often don't think they can ask mm. HR. I've I've spoken at organizations where the people who were attending the workshop came from different parts of the institution of the organization. And people are saying, I don't know how this is figured, what the the algorithm or the calculus is, and there's somebody from HR sitting there, and she says, Yeah, just come and ask us. We'll <laughs> tell you. Um, we're not hiding it. Um, so HR is a good place to start, but then you want to talk to the people you trust in your social and professional networks. And sometimes you talk to your boss. So, you know, I feel like maybe I didn't negotiate with enough information last time, or I want to know how I can be most productive and what I should be asking for, what you need to know in order to manage me better. Think of where you can get that information. Outside the organization, professional associations are a pretty good place to connect with people in your field. Often they have websites with women's pages. If Again, we're talking about just women's issues, and there's a lot of information available that way. If you know somebody who just, whatever, somebody you went to school with or someone you worked at um, a previous job with who's at a competitor, at, you know, at working for in the field at a peer institution, give them a call. Say, right. you know, what do you know? The networking piece is tremendously important for collecting information. Right. So you and do then your you research to, first, like either do external website information, which you get, right. pay scale, et cetera. You right. can do um, your networking and ask people, your internal networking to like right. ask your right. HR friends or your buddies who are doing yeah. a comparable job. So basically right. do the research to get a sense of what the norms are with respect right. to title, pay, responsibilities. Okay, cool. Right. And one other thing I just want to say about that is women often compare themselves or do their research, you know, looking at what other women are getting. Ah. And as they get more senior and there aren't that many women at that level, they're often comparing to people, to other women, people who they shouldn't be comparing themselves ah. to. Comparing themselves to the men at their level, not to the women who may be, you know, a few steps down. Yeah. And you know, there are a lot of men now, men in the prime of their careers whose mothers work, whose wives work, whose sisters work, whose daughters work, who are, you know, receptive and supportive of, you know, whatever. The ch they understand the challenges women have getting ahead, and they're happy to share what they know. Do you, it do you also have men that go like, why do you want to know what I make, and what, 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 what is this information being used for? Like, do you have that, or, or generally people are pretty open? Well, you get all sorts of responses, but again, you pick the right guys, you know, whatever, you, you know, these people, he's like, yeah, he's a jerk. He's not going to share the information right. with me, but this <laughs> he's guy, my competitor, you know, arch rival. Right, right. right. This guy's wife is very successful and I know he supports her. So maybe he'll, you know, quietly share some information and you say, I don't want to put you in a bind. I don't want to ask you to tell me something that you feel is it's risky or inappropriate to tell me, but whatever you can share that will help me establish the right range, the targets, what I should be aiming for, I'd so appreciate it. Okay, got it. So you do your research. Right. And then there's some like kind of logistic things that I, that you cover in the book, which I think are really important. Like, when do you have this conversation? Do you wait till review time? Do you wait like halfway through review time? Because there's certain large corporations, they have reviews every quarter, half a year, right. annual. So mm -hmm. is there a when that's matter that matters? Um, I assume the who is with your boss, um, mm -hmm. but then where is the other thing that you mentioned in your book? So I wanted you to touch on those two things. So let's start with when. Mm -hmm. um, when is to a certain degree organization specific. You know, when it, when are they making these decisions and when are they receptive to talking about these decisions before they're finalized. And I'm a big fan of making friends with the administrators, the assistants, the people who work for people in power. Right. They often have a lot of information, not just about how things have been done in the past, which is really useful, but about how their particular boss, supervisor, whatever, who, if it's you or, you know, mm -hmm. likes things to be done, present it in this way. Don't wait till the last minute. Then he'll be running around like his hair is on fire. Not a good time. You want to give him six weeks, approach him when, you know, things are calm, whatever. Get great some guidance. Great idea. I would oh, never then, thought of. Great idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there's a famous story of this woman, Lily Ledbetter, and there was eventually some uh, legislation, some federal legislation named after her. And Lily worked for Goodyear Tire in Georgia for like 30 years. Great evaluations. Everybody loved her. She was extremely good at her job. And she only discovered that she consistently been paid quite a bit less than her male peers because someone left her an anonymous note. 
I'm convinced it was somebody's assistant who saw this paperwork going across her desk year after year, and she knew how good Lily was, and she just couldn't stand it. So make friends with those people. When, I mean, also, you know, not when, you know, his hair is on fire, not when, you know, he's in the middle of a crisis, Um, not the day before all those decisions need to be finalized. Uh, Think about when is a good time for him, but also when is a good time for you, when you have had time to do all your research, digest it, make a plan, but don't wait too long. If you feel desperate, if you feel panicked, if you feel like, (gasps) you know, this is really critical or whatever, um, that you're not going to ask in a way that works well for you. Uh, That tension, that anxiety is going to come through. So don't put it off. There is interesting research. I always like to talk about the research about dread and how the more you put something off and you're dreading it, the less well you're going to do when the time. Mm, Right. Right. Do not Okay, yeah. so that's the when, that's and the when. Is there and there's an interesting where too that yeah Tell yeah me where is interesting. So we often think, okay, I'm just going to knock on his door and go into his office. A lot of people in power have offices that they sort of illustrate or embody like a big the power differential between you, like they're <laughs> behind the big right. yeah, a desk and you're down at your little <laughs> chair in front of them. And so the power differential is made salient by the environment. So a good thing to do if you can is say, hey, can we just go over to this uh, conference room here? Or can we go talk in the whatever lunch room or the cafeteria or the dining hall? Uh, Try to get out of that space. Other things to think about where you will not be interrupted, Mm -hmm. where you will not feel self-conscious because a lot of people are walking by and they're going to see you in that um, that conversation. Um, You know, where you won't be distracted. You know, think about a place that's quiet. The other one other thing I want to say, if you can do it, and of course you may not be able to de- determine this, but if you can, it's better to sit catty corner around the corner of a table from someone rather than opposite them. The opposite across the table actually creates a more adversarial energy between the two. Whereas if you're, you know, around, you know, around the corner of a table, you're showing him some data, you're pulling out some documents, you're illustrating why you want what you want. He's looking at the data. You're on the same side. Yeah. You know, I used to be a mediator, Mm -hmm. and we used to actually be very careful. When we actually set the table up, it had to have Mm -hmm. the same pad of paper, the same color pen. It had to be located in the same exact place. Because if you have any visual um, sense that there is a hierarchy or a preference, um, then it causes a problem. But I think all those kinds of things, sitting on the same side of the table, you know, you know, sitting at a round table versus a right. square table or yeah. not putting yeah. a lot of distance between the two of you. Those are yeah. all things that don't, like even with this radio interview, if I talk to you like this, people are like, why doesn't that CJ shut up? You know, because <laughs> because my face yeah, is so you're, big. You're, you're in her face, yeah. Yeah, it kind of has this visual, and I could actually just have an uncomfortable chair, but all these like visual things make actually a difference in actually how the person is responding to you. So mm-hmm. do your research, figure out when, figure out um, Where? what you want, what you were saying before, right, what yeah, you want, well. where you're going to do it. And then um, you... Uh, uh, is there anything else? I think the who, what, where, when, I think those were the things that you mentioned. And understand that they're biased, so there's a how you do it that right. is very specific. Right. Okay. So now I'm your um, I'm yeah. your boss, and you come in uh-huh. and, and, and make up fictitious data. Like, I don't care. But just pretend that you've done all the research, and, and I just want to get a sense of, like, okay. so you've set up. So do you set up a meeting with me in email, or, like, how, how do you? condition the thing so that I'm I'm not like, what are you doing in my office? Yeah, I've got stuff to do. Um, (laughs) This is where, again, the administrators and the assistants are great resources. When is a good time? Do not try to talk to him on Monday morning or, you know, Friday end of the day, he's very easygoing and relaxed before the weekend or whatever, but also how he likes to have you set it up. Does he want you to let him know in an email what the talk, the conversation is going to be about? Or can you just put me on his calendar for half an hour Thursday at 2 o'clock? Um, that's ideal if okay. you can just be on, on, on his calendar. If, um, if you let him know you want to negotiate, he may say, well, send it to me in an email. Oh. And oh. it's better not to spell it all out before you get into the room. If you can do it in person, that is really preferable because if you write out the whole proposal, which I'm always tempted to do because I'm a writer, I'm going to write it beautifully. Right. It's going to perfectly express so persuasive. What a great argument. <laughs> it's really 
easier for them just to reject the whole proposal if there's yeah. something in there they don't want. Uh, okay. Whereas if you're doing it in kind of real time, if you get a sense of, oh, that makes them uncomfortable or they're, you know, resistant to this part of the ask or the proposal, you can switch to something else and say, all right, well, let's, let's set that aside for now. Let's put a pin in it. There's some other things I want to talk about. Okay. And if you can get them to agree to some other things, things that maybe are less critical, easier for them to say yes to, once they agree to part of your proposal, there's a, they have a greater incentive internally you know, subconsciously to reach an agreement. There's more, you know, they're more likely to kind of want to land it. Um, Wait, can I go back to the when then? So if yeah. it's kind of review time and you're like, oh, I didn't get my act together. I didn't ask this woman. And I thought yeah. like, I might as well ask during review because that's the time for us yeah. to talk about my career trajectory. Right. Right. Um, is there like a disadvantage to doing that? Or is there a, a, is there a different way of approaching it if you decide during review time that that's the time that you should talk about it? Well, if you haven't done it before, do it then because otherwise it'll be another year or six months or right. whatever. The review, um, but you know, try to do some speedy preparation in the the days leading up to it. So if you have three days, you know, it's like oh darn, I didn't know what. Spend the nights, you know, between whatever Monday and Thursday, trying to get your thoughts together and organize and collect that data. Uh, you know, you could even say, perhaps I should have talked to you about this before, but since we're having this conversation now, I brought some data I want to uh, you know, okay. illustrate why I'm asking for what I'm asking okay. for. So somehow you've set up this meeting. I, mm -hmm. I know that you, this is about a conversation about your career. I don't know. I don't know if you're specific. Like I want to talk about my career. Or I, I want to talk about my title and like what, or do you just have like something generic? Like I would like to talk about my career and next steps. What would you well, do? To a certain degree, it, ha it, it depends on what you really want. Mm -hmm. S talking about, say, I'd like to talk about what I'm bringing to the team um, and you know, how I can be more productive and what that will involve both in terms of, you know, my long-term career plan, what you, where you see me going, what I'm hoping, and also, of course, laugh, smile, the compensation package. Okay. So start with, you know, I am committed to doing a great job for the organization. This is what a great job I'm doing already. And let's talk about the future. Okay. And with, Anybody, but again, you know, and this is my little special interest with women, you need to make what we call a relational argument. It's not so good to go in and say, look at all I've done. I want to be rewarded for it. Okay. What you need to do is say, this is what I'm bringing to the table. This is what I've accomplished. And it will be good for you to give me what I'm asking for because I will be able to ramp it up even further. Um, if you give me what I'm asking for, I can be even more productive. I can bring even more value to bear on whatever the group, the teams, the organizations, long-term strategy goals, whatever are. So you really need to make this argument that giving me what I'm asking for will help you be more successful. You, boss group, department, team, organization. So you really, of course, part of your research has to be what are the goals? What is the long-term strategy? Where's the company heading? And how can I say, I have this special talent. I have this history of leading an initiative like this, the one I'm asking to do. And I, you know, all negotiations, not all, most negotiations are about more than just how much you're going to pay me. They're more than just, they're about my opportunities, next steps, titles, re, you know, responsibilities, who I'm going to supervise, how much, whatever vacation time I'm going to get, when I'll be vested. They're usually about a lot of things. Okay. And so you need to present it as, you know, I'm so committed to this organization. I want to do more. Can we talk about what that's going to look like? Okay, per perfect. Okay, got it. So that would be kind of your going in conversation. Yeah, yeah, so be right. like, hey, I've been working here at Amazon for the last five years. Um, mm. I've landed a couple of really great deals, some of the some of the things that were actually critical and that were part of my goals. I'd like to actually, um, I want to talk a little bit about my career opportunities going forward in terms of specific projects I'd like to get experience with. I'd also mm. like to talk about compensation yeah. and also just opportunities generally, like where you see my career path going, what you see I'm bringing to the table and um, strengths, and then where you think I'm going. So um, I, that, then I, for me, I probably... That, that was beautiful. You did that when, when you said, and I'd also like to talk about compensation, sort of 
modulating a little with a smile, yeah. not apologetic, but we thought also, of course, you know, like yeah. talk about compensation, leaving that, you know, putting that in the mix because they actually respect you if you value yourself right. in, in general. Uh, you know, I, th I think we have this exam uh, example in one of the books that we think that more expensive things are better. We right. think, you know, a better, more expensive bottle of wine will actually be superior not always true. Some things are expensive and they're no better than the things that right. are, are true. But that is what we perceive. So if you underprice yourself and underprice yourself or accept less, people are going to you know, subconsciously think, well, she's worth less. Um, so you want to communicate that you have a sense of your own value and you want to support that, uh, you know, look at this initiative I led, this, you know, brought in X amount of business or helped us win these, you know, these great accounts or, you know, I get, get great feedback from this client about, you know, my work and has, you know, increased their loyalty or the portfolio has grown or whatever it is. You talk about what you've accomplished, why you're special, what makes you distinctive and how giving you what you're asking for will enable you to do more of that. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how I would say, how would me, that enable me more? So it's like, and I, you know, I, so let me see if I can land that. So I would say, yeah. okay. you know, what actually one of the most important values for me is, is personal growth and learning. And I actually yeah. really, really want to learn more about mergers and acquisitions, which I haven't had a lot of experience with. And I'd mm -hmm. also like to um, manage other people, which I think I'd be yeah. good at. And so mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out how we move my position into those kind of new areas. Is that, mm -hmm. would that work? Or like, how, how would you do the, I, you know, I I'll do more if you give me more. Yeah, I mean that. I I think there's a little bit like I think I would be very good at it. It would be better to say in another role I did actually have some supervisory responsibilities that I shared with them. You know, whatever. Try to draw an uh, not just I think I'll be good at it, but I have a little track record. I think I you know would love to I'd do like more. To build on that. Okay, got yeah. it. So it's like, yeah. I, and, and I think that this would benefit both the company, right. Amazon, the company to actually have me grow in these right. areas. And it would actually make me feel more motivated because I'd be learning and growing in new areas. And so I think that's both, what both of us want is to actually yeah. have me feel like I'm growing and learning. And, and then I want to talk about compensation. So like, that, so like, so yeah. we have this conversation about like learning and growing and how I'm so great and how you're so great and how we're going to help yeah. the company. So how do you lead this into the whole compensation piece? Okay, so I just want to say one more thing before yeah. we get there, which is I just read an article about Amazon. Oh, it was actually about Jeff Bezos that said there are these 14 principles or these, you know, whatever, yeah. the mission statement oh, or yeah, something. They have all these statements and everything. Right. Yeah, and if that's important to your organization, if the mission statement is sort of front and center and or they whatever, then try to use some of that language. Okay. Yes, that good point. Great. Yeah, so I'm, yeah. Like, I'm looking at, and I'm, I have a bias for action. That's one of the things. Yeah. I have a strong mm -hmm. bias for action. I've proven that in these yeah. cases. Yeah. Okay, and I also have a passion for growth or passion for customers. And blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So whatever yeah. it is that can... Yeah, try to sound sincere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a marketing person, so I just yeah. rattle this stuff off. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. so then how do you move that into the salary? So, you know, you've talked about your career and trajectory and, like, your growth and what areas that you'd like, yeah. so... And like, I want to talk about next steps to move me further to that. What, what are some of the things that I would need to, um, training or things that I would need to do in order to move us in that direction. So, so that would be the conversation. So that's relatively easy. I think most classes yeah. are pretty easy on that. Right. How do you talk about salary then? How do you weave well, it into salary? You know, okay, so this is all great. I'm very excited about the future. I think, you know, this conversation is going to lead to a lot of good things for the company. So let's talk about compensation. You know, you can even say that's always a little tricky, but I've done some research. I've got some data and, you know, show them the data. Any actual physical supporting documents you can provide that, uh, you know, establish yes you're working from some concrete information increases the odds they'll give you what you want so i've done some research i've talked to some people i you know got this data from hr or whatever and it seems to me that someone performing at my level doing what i'm doing with such great evaluation such a, a great whatever success um story should probably be getting near the top of the range and the top of the range as i understand it is whatever and you say whatever the top of the range is. And I, you know, I, I know 
you know, always want to sort of flatter the other person. I know that Amazon likes to award people appropriately. It likes to be generous to people who are high performers. And so I'm hoping that that will be possible, you know, whatever the number is. I'm hoping we can get such and such. And in whatever such and such is, whatever the top of the range, you need to ask for, you know, near the top of the range, but do not do it in an aggressive way. Say, I've done my research. Given that I'm such a high performer, I have, you know, whatever this track record, it seems like it would be appropriate for me to get the top of the range, which is X. So find out what the top of the range is and ask for it because they are going to push you down. Yes. So don't ask for what you think they'll give you. Ask for more than that because they're going to counter offer. They're going to negotiate with you. Um, there's a research study Linda Babcock, my co-author, did in which she videotaped you know, a couple of actors and um, in one scenario, one condition as they call it in social science, a man or a woman, they had been, I think, working as interns and now they were, being, they were talking to HR about being hired permanently. And in one, they just talk about it and they don't bring up salary. In the other, you know, there are two videos, one of the man, one of the woman, they bring up salary and say, I think based on my track record, I should get the, you know, the top of the range. And then Linda shows this to a bunch of people and, you know, asks how likable they seem, because as we know, women need to be likable to get what they want. In the condition where neither of them asked the women and the men, you know, pretty, pretty equally likable. And the one where the woman says, I think I should get the top of the range. And she's coached, the actress has been coached to say it in a fairly strong way, her likability goes down, his not so much. So the tone, again, I keep coming back to this, really matters a lot. Yeah, and, and what was interesting when you you did a lot of the things that you mentioned in the book, you tilted your head, yeah. you had your hands like I'm oh you give this body yes, language open, like but, yeah, I'm right. open to balance things around. I'm just doing an, yeah. uh, an overemphasis and of when people look at the video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was because I'm a coach, right? So I'm looking at your physiology. So there, there, you're using your hands and kind of creating this open, like, listen, I'm open to negotiating, and you're kind of doing this. You're also doing this with your eyes, where mm -hmm. it's like this kind of thing, like you know, or you know, like it was just being kind of. I, I don't know if it was coy or kind of like more innocent. It had this kind of different physiology than when we're talking just on right, the interview. Right. So it's interesting that. The physiology that your and body language that you're presenting was different when you're asking yeah. about the well, salary. Well, unfortunately, I mean, this is what your friend, the lawyer, she ran into. It's not the, you know, the body behavior, the, you know, body language that she would use when she's actually doing her job. Yeah, she'd be like, she, listen, look, gonna, yeah, gonna, yeah, gonna, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so this is the deal. This is what you're getting, da, da, da. And that doesn't work that well. Now, I may have overplayed it a little right then, but using no, your social skills to communicate that you're not threatening, that you're likable, that you're, we're just talking, um, can be really helpful. Yeah. So one, uh, you know, one example is you could sort of knock on the door and say, I just got this better offer. And if you don't match it, I'm going to walk. Right. Man could do that. And they'd say, Oh, he's really a great employee. I'll give him what he wants. Woman, like, don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> so, but a woman, if you take the approach, uh, so, you know, can we talk? I really love my job. I think you're a great boss. I love working here, but I got this other offer. And it's, you know, it's a good offer and it's for more money. And I really don't want to leave, but it's a good offer. So I thought maybe we could talk about finding a way to make it possible for me to stay. Right. So, you know, yeah. then it's, it's like, yeah, she is really valuable. And the market thinks she's valuable because she's got this other offer. Um, let's you know, let's not let her go. Well, it's interesting because I'm now I'm, I'm listening from a, again, I'm a coach, right? So I'm listening yeah. to your voice and the tonal thing was like, and it's a good offer. So it's not like, yeah. and it's a good offer, right? Like if I yeah. were negotiating, I'm like, listen, I got this deal. It's a good offer. So right. like you're like, and it's a good offer. Like, so there yeah. is this like, you have to soften, you have to go a little yeah, softer. Even the language the is kind of, yeah, and it softens and it trails down. Not that you're uncertain, oh, but it's like, yeah. what am I going to do? It's right. a good yes. offer. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> there's, there's all yeah. these like subtle things. So um, I think what this brings to mind is in, in the book, Ask For It, and the other book, you mm. mentioned the idea of like practicing. It's so important 
to practice yeah. over mm-hmm. and over. I can't tell you how many times I talk to clients and they're like, so I was thinking about 40 or 45 is the range yeah. I'm looking at. I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't yeah. say that. Yeah. <laughs> that means I'm not really sure if I'm worth it, but I'm going to throw yeah. out this really big number and hope that that's a percentage increase. Yeah. <laughs> like it's like, and if you don't practice that over and over again, it just, you, it doesn't land and people, I don't know what it is. People can just sniff that, that there's like, you don't have power. Right. <laughs> you can be pushed off that position you've just staked out so easily. Yeah, um, exactly. So there's another piece about the role playing and people often feel like little goofy or self-conscious role playing. But if you coach whoever you're going to role play with and say, this is what I'm worried about. This is how I'm afraid they might react. I think if I ask for this much, they might push back, come on strong, or they might, you know, point to this mistake I made once or, you know, undermine me in some way and then play it through and ask whoever it is to really push your buttons and say the things that will hurt your feelings, insult you, make you mad, embarrass you, make you want to whatever, burst into tears and run out of the room. And then practice responses that are calm, composed, not, you know, going towards the conflict. But let's talk about the, you know, the things we both want. Let's talk about our shared goals. And the good thing about that is if the thing you're worried about actually happens in the negotiation, you're not surprised. If you've had the emotion triggered in the role play, it doesn't throw you if it gets triggered in the negotiation because you've already had it and you've prepared for it. And it turns out it is the surprise as much as anything else that tends to derail us. We go, all right, now I'm upset. I don't want, I don't want, okay, I'll take whatever's on the table. (laughs) And then we run out of the room. I mean, you know, we all sound ridiculous the way I acted out, but you know what? The internal oh, voice. I completely yeah. agree. All right. So I'm going to do a couple of practice ones that I've never okay. really have a client said when they go in for raises. So, as, as you know, Sarah, um, we actually have certain ranges, and at this point, you're at the highest part of the range. Um, or yeah. I have some issues right now because I have other people at your range, uh, your, you know, who've been here actually longer than you that are performing equally as well. And so I really, even though I understand everything that you've mentioned, I cannot, we have no other wiggle room at this point. So it's kind Mm -hmm. of like there's parity issues. Um, I have this a lot with engineers. Limited resources. Yeah, Mm -hmm. like I have a lot of like nonprofits have the, we can't do, governments have this, we have parity issues. Okay, mm-hmm. nonprofits are like, I just don't have any money to give you. What right. else can we offer? Right. And mm-hmm. then um, uh, engineers, I've noticed, have this kind of mm-hmm. like, I had to like claw my way <laughs> up the ladder and you will too. That's yeah. just how it right. works. Right. Okay. No legs up for anybody. <laughs> exactly. So um, thoughts on how to handle, like those are three possible things right. that I've heard. Right. Um, any thoughts on those? Yeah, so uh, a number of things. One is this is where the research is really critical because if they say, well, there are people at the same level doing, you know, work that's just as good as yours, and you could say, well, actually, I am doing something in addition to what the job description uh, stipulates. I actually am bringing more more value, or I've taken on this extra project, or I'm doing something that actually is in the job descri- description of the next level up. Because in the government and nonprofits, they're like, you're at level four, you're you know C two three, right. whatever. You know. <laughs> um, I mean, there's some of these places, it's right. you know parsed like ridiculously fine so you need to be prepared to say actually i'm not identical to those people so that's one thing you want to be prepared for the other of course you've done your um your research and you found out actually they just got a big donation or the organization has is redirecting a lot of capital to this division because they want to build out or expand what they're doing so you know actually that the situation is changing and there might be more resources than they want to let on because it may be you know just a a, a whatever a a tactic yeah this is what everybody else is getting so that's what you're going to get so that's those are two pieces and the third piece is it might be true they may not have any more money. They may not have any more wiggle room. And then you need to think about, is there something else they can give you? Could they give you some more time? Could you have a more flexible schedule? Could you work at home a couple days a week? Because people are more productive when they don't spend all that time in traffic commuting. Um, and, you know, is, is there something else? Would you like an extra week of vacation? Is there a title that more appropriately describes what you're doing that you feel like is 
you know, totally obvious and, and you should have gotten, but it hasn't. Well, so if you can't give me more money, could you at least give me the title? In general, I'd say don't take on more responsibility George, if you're not getting George, more money. Just but get the title. If, <laughs> but if the title, of, you know, if what you're doing, the title or the level or the rank or whatever, does not accurately describe what you're bringing, then you can ask for that. But think about what else would make a difference to your life. What would help you be more productive? or happier? What would be make things more convenient or just, you know, run more smoothly? So go in prepared with that. And of course, the last thing you can do if you're expecting that is get another offer. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this has been fantastic. Do you realize I, I could talk to you forever on this stuff? I find this stuff uh, fascinating. We've been talking. Yeah. Thank you so much. We've been talking to Sarah Lashaver about her book, Ask for It. Thank you so much. So let me just say tips. a yes. lot of research links on my website, saralashiver.com. I put in links to a lot of resources for figuring out what you're worth and what other people are getting paid. So okay. just my name, saralashiver.com. Thank you. Thank you. So much. All right. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support, love, and blessings.